there, and welcome to the Hit Like a Girl podcast. I love that we get to share our platform with members of our health IT community. As we approach the annual HIMSS conference, we'll be sharing bonus episodes with Grace Vinton as a guest host, interviewing lady bosses in her network to share their expertise and advice. So this is Joy, passing the mic to Grace. Take it away. High Tea with Grace, where we spill the tea on HIT. I am very excited to welcome my guest, Jess Damasa. She is a HIT consultant and host of WTF Health, which is What's the Future Health, as well as co-host of the healthcare blogs Health in 2.0 with Matthew Holt, where they playfully and insightfully weigh in on all the latest funding deals in digital health and HIT. Thanks for joining us, Jess. Uh, Grace, it's such a pleasure to be here. I'm so excited. We're so excited to have you on. So tell us all about how you got into healthcare. Oh my goodness, how I got into healthcare. So um, I'm going to pick up like kind of midway through my healthcare journey where I ended up working for uh, Blue Cross Plan. So I used to work for Florida Blue, which became Guidewell. And I was on their brand team. And then I transitioned to their innovation team. And I was there when they um, reorganized into the mutual insurance holding company Guidewell and broke out the innovation team into its own line of business so that we could do a lot more in terms of you know scouting and sourcing and investing in um, some of these non-insurance core type businesses. So at the time, this was when like digital health was really starting to kind of turn a corner. Telehealth was starting to be implemented in, in plans. Um, there was just a lot of talk about AI and what was possible. And it was like the first time I had ever heard the term data lake. Like there was just a <laughs> lot going on in this space. So I got my start there. And then um, I, I ended up leaving Blue Cross and, and found, founding my show um, because of the fact this is such a strange thing. So um I was doing all this innovation work and um, decided to leave and come back and consult. And one of the things that Guidewell hired me back for, because they had this new brand, was to be a roving reporter at like this very bleeding edge, you know, super techie healthcare conference called Exponential Medicine, which is hosted by Daniel Kraft. I'm sure a lot of the people who are listening know Daniel. So they were like, you know about this from your job. You're a beat and energetic. Go talk to some people. And so they sent me out there with like a camera guy and a microphone. And believe it or not, your your listeners might know this guy, but my first interview ever at Exponential Medicine was Jamie Edwards, the CEO of Cloudbreak Health, which got acquired by or went into that SPAC with Up Health. And Jamie at the time just raised like his Series A, and it was like truly he was he was oh, my wow. First That's ever. Isn't that funny. <laughs> I know. Oh, what a like small world, right? So he's been along for my entire um, my entire career as somebody who who does interviews. Um, but from that, um, I ended up meeting Matthew, and Matthew invited me to do interviews at Health 2.0, and then. I ended up meeting uh, Eugene Burakovich there from Bayer, who at the time was running g and was their head of digital health. And he's like, there's this new conference in Europe called Frontiers Health. We'd love to have you come. And that's how I got my first sponsor. So Bayer sponsored me to go, did Frontiers. And like, that was it. And like, at that point already, I had interviewed like almost 100 people in this space. And it has wow. been like nonstop since then. <laughs> That's amazing. And, you know, I'm a regular viewer and listener to your podcasts and shows. I absolutely love them. And I also love your clubhouse chats that you do with companies. And I definitely sit in and as a listener and just really feel like I learned so much from you all. Um, I especially love when you talk about like the topic of digital health investments and, you know, kind of health IT and what's going on in the industry because there's so much much happening, especially in the past two years. Oh my so God, Grace, the last like, two years have been like, they have been bananas. Like it has been just, a, a, it has been next level. And like Matthew and I, it's, you, you had mentioned our show that we do together where we cover health tech funding deals. It's called Health in 2.00. It's riffing off of the conference he had with Indu Sabaya, Health 2.0. So basically I asked him about the big funding deals in two minutes. So these it's episodes- so playful kind of, and exciting uh, and insightful. <laughs> it's like playful and insightful, which is so nice in this industry. It's like, uh, it's edutainment, we like to say. <laughs> and so like, 
like, it is it's fun and we try to do it quick hit, but sometimes, you know, he's crotchety and builds himself as a healthcare curmudgeon. So he likes to go off on tangents, especially at the end. So sometimes these episodes are like six minutes long and sometimes they're like 15, depending on what, what he feels like riffing about. But I'm glad that people find them playful. And I mean, it's fun. It's fun to like talk about this stuff, especially now in the last two years, because it's been moving so fast. I mean, the number of funding deals has, has just... It ticked up so high. The, the amount of money in each round has gone up about $10 million on average from last year to this year. And then even just like the total funding. I mean, we're already at, I think it's like $20 billion for the year in digital health funding, according wow. to the Rock Yeah. Down. And to yeah. put that into perspective, last year's total for all four quarters was like just shy of $15 billion. So we've already passed what we did all of last year, and we, that doesn't even count any of the Q4 numbers. And I think the Q4 numbers, I feel like we're going to see a little flurry of activity before the end of the year. And then, you know, we always kick things off in January at JP Morgan with a bunch of deals too. So it'll be exciting to see how this continues to, to go. Yeah, it's interesting. I think about funding deals that were happening like 10 years ago, you know, and they were like, if you got 20 million, you were doing great. You know, if you got 40 million, you were doing great. Now, if you're in a later series and it's not 100 million, it's like, what? Why, why are we even what? talking? No. About that? I joke around about that all the time, Grace, with Matthew. I'm like, why are we even talking about this? Like, I, and it's totally like I'm being completely playful about it. But it's oh, like, of course, these rounds, the number of companies that have raised over 100 million just on our list, and our list is not a definitive list, but it's like we've gotten like at least three or four dozen companies that have raised 100 million dollar rounds. And some of those companies, like Olive or Medible, repeat offenders in the over 100 million dollar round game know, over the last see, couple of years. See, I mean, they're getting. Incredible. And then six months later, they're getting a second inje you know, injection of funding. And you're like, wait, I thought wow. I just got a ton of money. What's going on? What's going on? Great. Yeah. So yeah. it'll be exciting to see what happens. Like as we move, you know, I mean, we're in a weird spot right now, right? With COVID and COVID obviously was a catalyst for a lot of the investment here. And it's interesting though, because I, um, I do some work with Amwell and Amwell put out a survey about buying and they were focused specifically on like virtual care and digital health, but their buying survey shows they, they worked with Hims Analytics to do it. And they oh, wow. asked decision makers in health systems and in health plans, what their, what their appetite was for investing in virtual care or digital health next year. And it was like on the, on the health system side, it's like one in two are planning to invest. And on the health plan side, it was the same. And it's like, what's interesting about this, I feel like this is a like moving forward in this Amwell survey. This was the result they took from the whole thing. And I encourage anybody who's interested, just take a look because it's interesting to understand what, what areas the investment is going to go into. Like hospitals are investing in virtual and digital very differently than plans are. Very and so true. it's like they've got like some nuances of what they want to get out of it, you know, like member engagement on the plan side versus like reducing cost on the hospital side. And like how this is starting to play out because this is like, you know, now that we have like a big enough use case for virtual and digital as a result of the pandemic, we're starting to see how people are really using it and what their plans are to use it. And so like even one of the things I've noticed just conversationally, because, you know, for Grace, I am in addition to reporting on the space and doing a little bit of analysis, I am also a gossip. And so <laughs> I like well, to, I love know, I like to ask you what's going on. right spot at the right <laughs> time because this is where we'll get the tea. All right. Exactly. <laughs> so um, so I, one of the things I'm hearing a lot. And I'm hearing this in conversations I'm having with people in my interviews. I'm hearing this, you know, um, just in the stuff I'm reading and I'm hearing this on stage at some of the conferences is the word omni-channel. And yeah. that's different. So, I mean, before we were talking about virtual care as a completely different thing, then it kind of morphed into a virtual first. And that seemed to be like, you know, the, the mantra, like, let's start them there. And then now it's like really like this whole idea of omni-channel where it's like, okay, this is not separate. This is not just the place to start, but let's look at this as an entirely different channel for patients where certain things might make more sense to happen virtually or digitally or involving remote patient monitoring or be put into the home as opposed to in a more expensive place of care. And then there's like this whole idea of like, how can we augment the stuff that is happening in person with digital? And so it really is this, I feel like it's a difference. It might be a little bit nuanced, but it's a difference to me in how you're, I'm hearing these people who are making buying decisions or who are integrating virtual and digital into health plans and into health systems talk mm -hmm. about their strategy moving forward. So like well, that's think, really exciting. That to makes me. a ton of sense. And it's so great that people are starting to be able to see the whole picture of the whole patient to even understand what the needs are 
and how to meet those needs. You know, it seems in order to get there, you need to be able to see the whole patient. And until recently, there weren't enough investments and time put into uh, the, the quality interoperability to be able to actually see the whole story and then say, okay, this is where we fit. And exactly. it's interesting that so many of these software companies are becoming providers. <laughs> oh my gosh, absolutely. And it's like on that point, Grace, it's like they're becoming providers because it's like the other thing they're starting to do too. And this is another like little thing that I've started to pick up on. It's like you talk to enough people, your certain phrases start to rise to the top, right? Just like omni-channel. Another one that I feel like has been really hot lately is operating system. And it's like the companies that are talking about building their own operating system. And I'm like, hang on a minute. The operating system underneath healthcare delivery used to be the EMR. And in a lot of places, I'm not going to say that this is like happened already and the the tide is turned or whatever. Still, it is very much an epic concern or world, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm hearing companies like Accolade talk about building an operating system. Now, they're also not even just doing navigation. They're doing care delivery and they're building an operating system to support all of that so that they own their own data stream. I'm hearing companies like Olive talk about building the internet of healthcare, right? They're in almost all of the major hospitals in this country. And like they are really building like this whole different system that automates a lot of the the things that currently are being done by people that is like preventing them from like doing their job at the the top of their ability. And I'm not even just talking about clinicians, but I'm talking about back office administrators as well. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I'm hearing more and more. I mean, Amwell talks about building the operating system that underlies the connection between in-person care and virtual care. So they can be interoperable and seamless. So it's like more and more, I feel like I'm starting to hear this phrase. Oh, there's another example. I was just thinking of Firefly Health. There's a lot of primary care clinics that are virtual first that are building their own system because they're like, you know what? I don't want to plug into the big EMR unless I have to. And I'm going to figure out what that API looks like. But for the rest of all of the stuff that I'm doing to deliver care, I'm just going to build my own thing. And it's like, I feel like in the past, people used to just be fine chilling as middleware. Mm -hmm. And they're like, we're we're middleware, you know, and if that's a good place to be, it's good to be the pipes. But now they need to have the whole enterprise. It's no It's no longer okay to just be middleware in many ways. I mean, right. there's still important parts for middleware, but you know, it seems like you're saying they need to be the enterprise. They need to be the operating system itself. Well, yeah, and you're seeing companies like um, like like Zeus, Comier, um, even Olive to a degree where they're starting to build these marketplaces where it's like some of these companies, they don't even have to build their own stuff, like appointment mm-hmm. scheduling or like, you know, uh, t- like a text feature from like a nurse. Like, I mean, there's stuff like that that already exists where it's like a plug and play and you can just land your data somewhere and, and own all of it and have that whole stream and not even really need to worry about the EMR integration in the traditional sense. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I know that this is like, very, this is very like early days on this side of it, but, you know, and I, I talked to actually Raj Singh, the CEO of Accolade about this. When we were talking about the operating system language he just started landing and he's like, and I'd asked him, you know, is it, do you, do you get the sense that these health tech companies really have a different view on sharing data than some of the incumbent organizations that have, have ownership of data or even some of like the health systems or the plans? And he's like, absolutely. Like, he's like, there definitely is this appetite among healthcare in innovators to share the data and build things that are, that make it shareable to a degree. Right. And kind of go from there. And I feel like just, this is Jessica DeMassa talking. There's like this shadow system of health IT infrastructure that's being built alongside like what currently exists, but it's like, what's going to be interesting is as the years go on here. And I do say years, cause it's, this is not a fast switch. You know, how does that sentiment among like the innovators and that that willingness to share data and build things that make that easier that are just like like and that stop the call. like we don't need to talk about interoperability because it is you know yes. like how long is that going to be but it'll be exciting to see how that goes and then what's going to end up happening if there is going to be pressure ultimately put on the incumbent organizations that's not just federal regulations that are Mm -hmm. loosely implemented at this point, but that really do start to make it change the conversation around data and accessibility and shareability and that, and and reframe that whole interoperability discussion. 
Absolutely. And it's so interesting you, meant, you mentioned, fe, you know, the fe, fe, federal regulations because, you know, they really aren't implementing them. They have no, there, there's no muscle behind these things, even though they're fabulous and wonderful and the price transparency and everything. And it's interesting that companies, hospital health, health systems payers are realizing whether the government tells them or not, it's beneficial to be sharing this data and for all of us to have access to it. Absolutely. And I think we learned that lesson in COVID when it was just like, there's just no, I mean, like, why don't we know who has it, who doesn't remember early days? It was like, why don't we have, like, it's impossible to even know what's going on. Like, and, and it's like, I think that really exposed that. And I think, yes. I mean, and, and to say, to, to back up for a second, I know that COVID was a reason that a lot of those, the, the implementation of those regulations did not go into oh, effect yeah. to give the hospitals a yeah. break and that they, they definitely the deserve. You know, extending yeah. the deadlines. And the yeah, and like, they're totally, cool totally cool with that. Totally cool with it. But eventually, you know, as this, as, as the, you know, living with the pandemic becomes the new normal, you know, on and on. I mean, th- there is a benefit even just for the pandemic in terms of yeah. patient care to have that in place, to have that data trans- transparency in place. So it'll be exciting to see how that all unfolds. Yeah. How do you feel like patients are going to be impacted most by all of these investments that have been happening? You know, we were talking about, you know, virtual care, these new mm-hmm. operating systems where, you know, care at home. You know, what do you see as uh, the biggest impact to patients from all of this excitement? Oh my God. So I think that what's going to end up happening, it's going to be like truly, it's going to be healthcare consumerism, like in the way that we've been. And I know that's been such a phrase for like the longest time, but it's like, Girl, truly, I feel it. I, I'm, I'm here for it because I'm here for it too. But like, I Unless think it's real, I, you know? <laughs> I mean, I do. I think what's going to end up happening is that the more people, and I think that this is one of the things that if it's like, you look back at like, you know, the, the, the dark days of the pandemic, when everybody was forced to go virtual, it was that opportunity that like, you know, I think we had all in this, in the space of virtual care, digital remote patient monitoring, um, had, had looked for in the sense that it's like, everybody was kind of forced to try it. And it was like a lot of people, even though it has gotten like the, the utilization for, for those types of, um, healthcare services has dialed back. It's still way higher than it ever was before. And I think that this is where it's like, like I said before, I think health systems and health plans are trying to figure out strategically now what's next. We bought all this stuff just yeah. to make sure that we could deliver care during the pandemic. We stood it up fast. We did what we had to do to mobilize, to take care of our communities and our, and our members. But now what are we going to do with it? And that's where that whole idea, like, I mean, omni, that whole omni channel, that whole, like, how do you, how do you make the data experience, the data sharing experience? What that end up, what that's going to end up doing is improving the, the patient experience, the ability to, to get care wherever you really want it. Right. And that was always the idea the patient owning their record. And it's also going to improve the, the quality of care that's delivered. So in terms of not only just like accessibility that we always talk about with digital or with virtual, but also I think in terms of just the data collection on the back end of that is going to allow things to become much more personalized. You know, Mm -hmm. so it's like there's some really cool stuff coming down the pike. And it's like, you know, from companies like OneDrop that's using sensors or companies like um, Transparent that are looking at new ways of pricing and like really kind of building that building their businesses in a way that are putting the consumer first. And I think that a lot of the investment dollars that are going into companies like those, or even companies like Medible that are doing these centralized clinical trials and helping speed those up so patients can get the drugs that they need and they're reducing the cost to pharma companies to develop those drugs and to run those trials. Like there's just going to be a benefit that I hope nets out in you know, lower, lower cost healthcare that's more personalized and it meets people where they are. Like, and I think that that's kind of what we've all been moving for. And I think like we might be, you know, some of these startup companies, another buzzword for me this year has been at risk, at risk. It's like everybody's talking about going at risk. And the reason they're able to go at risk, I think in a lot of, a lot of cases is the fact that it's like, they are these, some of these startups are multimodal you know, they've got people, they've got tech and then they've got data. So it's like, they're able to, you know, to care for somebody and, and collect enough information where they are addressing multiple conditions at one time. They are providing higher, like um, more personalized care that, that meets the specific need of the patient. And they're willing to put their own 
fees on the line to meet those objectives. And so I think at the end of the day, patient care is going to be improved by all of this. What needs to happen is that we need to get patients greater visibility into a lot of this stuff that's going on that they're just not privy to. Because it's like, I mean, even my own experience, Grace, I was sick for a couple of weeks, a few weeks ago. Uh, and it was like, I couldn't find the virtual care portal on my health plan You're website. Like, I was test? looking for it. <laughs> my portal. <laughs> oh, like, I can't find this. Why is this so hard to find? Like, so, I mean, I think like if I were to, I mean, all the investment is great, but we still need the support of the, the, the plans and the, the health systems in terms of creating visibility among the people they serve, because they've got those people's attention, you know, and they know, and that's like the, the first place somebody goes when they're sick, either the plan to find out, you know, where should I go for care or whatever, or to, to the, the, the health center or to the doctor's office office itself. Yeah. It's been really interesting to me, you know, with how the investments have been going and with ha- with the consumerization of healthcare, how the lines between HIT and and digital health and, you know, pharma and life sciences are are becoming more blurred and the importance of the patients, you know, are, are, are becoming, it's becoming more and more important that patient and physician experience um, and to make sure that, you know, all of the things are working along together. Absolutely. Have you seen that as well? That's kind of I am. I am. And so I really feel like this is now like the way I start to talk about like health tech broadly, which to yeah. me is like, okay. And I know everybody's got their own nomenclature for this stuff that you speak like, I mean, we're whatever. So I'm trying to fit the note, like fit this into some sort of like a, a hierarchy of like an, an architecture of like, what, what is like, what is the category here? So for me, I always say health tech and health innovation. And it's like, what we're seeing on that hit side of things, it's like, there's, there's two sides of it. There's technology that's enabling new healthcare services. So new tech, like the technology there is like the chatbots, the remote patient monitoring, the virtual care. And specifically in like the hit world, it's like, this is the rev cycle stuff. This is the hospital automation stuff. This is the analytics stuff. This is the tech that's enabling new healthcare services. And then the other side of it are these startups that are new healthcare services based on technology. And so those are like the new plans that we're seeing like sidecar health or the new PBMs like Capital Rx. I mean, so it's like, and even businesses like um, these navigators, like Accolade, or the way that Included Health has morphed now, or Transparent in the navigator space, or even like um, some of the home health organizations. You know, I mean, we just saw you know CareCentrics get a massive investment from Walgreens. Like, there's just these are brand new healthcare services that are powered on technology, and then we're seeing those old healthcare services that are integrating the tech. So it's like two different sides to me of that, and it's like there are a lot of companies that are kind of straddling both of those places. But it's like the, what you can't escape is that the IT infrastructure is critical to all of this. Absolutely. And do you think that eventually they'll all just be joined with each other? <laughs> I, hope so. I mean, it would be nice. I mean, it would be nice if like if, if not joined together, I mean, at least like where they work together. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's like that, that there really is this seamless care experience that everybody always talks about as like the nirvana of our space that is patient centered. And it's like the, the, the care is really driven off of what this individual person's needs are, how we're able to use tech to figure out what those needs are and then develop, you know, the right way to reach them in this. I mean, and I'm going to say it, the omni channel kind of way where it's like some stuff you're going to need to do in person, no matter what, some stuff you're going to need to do, you know, um, it's better for you to do, Um, And it might not even be possible for you to do without tech, like daily remote monitoring. If you have a condition that you need to track every day, it's expensive if somebody's going to come out there and do that with you. So but, but if you can use tech to do it, that's more and more ambient that requires, you know, a device that's already there in your home or requires something that you're just wearing that's measuring and monitoring at all times. Like, I mean, I think that what the, what's the potential here is really this whole idea of having this just be the same way. Like to me, I think about, you know, everybody talks about banking, but I think about shopping and it's just like, you know, how do you figure out, you know what you want or you know what you need, or sometimes it's like, you know, the need comes to you, you're like, oh shoot, I really need to buy this because I don't know, like I need to buy a ladder because you have to get up on my roof or something in my house. And it's like, sometimes it's like, you have to get that. And it's like, you know, how do you buy that? Do you go to the store? Do you order online and have it delivered to you by a person? Or is is this something that you like, is, is there something that you can do by ordering a service to have somebody come out and do it for you? I mean, like, and I think if we look at that in healthcare and the omni-channel kind of analogy, that to me is what I think is really exciting and promising about all of the investment that's coming into 
this space, particularly on the tech side. Well, it's so true. And before they used to just look at data for data's sake, like, all right, like yeah. do the link. let's just throw it all together and then figure out what to do with it. And you're so right. It's like shopping. Now they're saying, this is what I need to go buy. So I'm going to the best store and this is exactly how, what I need to do to make this recipe or whatever else. And it's, yeah. it's really viewing it differently, not just yeah, or like you, you bought this mm-hmm. and people who have bought this have also bought this. Like, exactly. okay, great. Yes. I mean, yeah. imagine mm-hmm. applying that to like somebody who's like polychronic, you know, and trying to take care of multiple diseases or it's like even just learning from from patients who already have a certain profile right and it's like applying what you've learned there imagine how how quickly you could you could help improve somebody's day-to-day life by just saying like here are some recommendations from people who are who, who have presented just like you I mean that's really cool I mean that's really really cool to me Really cool. And it truly will improve patient safety and the quality of healthcare for sure. Yeah. Um, very interesting stuff. I so- know. And I'm like such a futurist because like, I know that this is way far out there. So anybody who's like, oh my God, this is so pie in the sky. I'm like, I know you're right. But it's like, you know, it's like, if we don't, if this, if we're not tracking towards, you know, something amazing, I, I just feel like it's like, what's the point of all of this money that's flowing into this space? And what's the point of trying to go through the process of integrating it? So it's Absolutely. like, it's like, I've got to have to get this creative. Like, <laughs> <laughs> You're so right. We need to have these futuristic views and get creative. And also for people who are in the hit community and are working in the trenches every single day, I mean, they can see that, you know, th- that maybe down the road, this could really be impactful. And it-, it shows so much more meaning to what they're doing every day to see that this is going to impact all of our lives. Absolutely. That's why I, I always say I have the best job in this space because like I get to talk to people who are super optimistic about the future, whether it be an entrepreneur or an investor or somebody in an incumbent organization who's leading yes. strategy and innovation mm-hmm. or, or whatever, like how integrating all that stuff. And it's like, I feel like, like every day I'm so blessed because I get to have like, just like it, my soul uplifted by the optimism and positive forward looking, you know, viewpoints of these people who are just, you know, like they see a, a vision for a better healthcare system yeah. in this country. And it's like, and it's like, this is how we're gonna get there. And it's like, all right, let's give it a shot. <laughs> Absolutely. What an amazing thing. So on that line, you know, the Hit Like a Girl podcast loves to really understand what drives women in health IT. And so, you know, on that note, what are some of the work that you've been most proud of through the years? Oh my gosh. Um <sighs> That's tough. I mean, I'm, I think I'm proud of the fact that I like, I think I'm really proud of the the number of interviews that I have done in like the five years that I've been doing this. I mean, I'm talking thousands of interviews, Grace. Like there was my record. I had at one year I did, um, startup health festival. Um, I partnered up with them and I was there on the floor at JP Morgan at their big event. And it's like, I interviewed 100 startups in two days. (laughs) <laughs> and it was like, I mean, honest to God, like, and you know, JP Morgan, it's like you go to the happy hours afterward and it's all of these like venture yeah, capitalists and like private bros. equity. And like, <laughs> like somebody talked to me because I've literally talked to every health tech startup here. And I can tell you right now <laughs> what's good and what's not. Test me, test me. I'm up for it. <laughs> like somebody put me for information. So, <laughs> but I think like what I'm proud of though, is that is, um, I work really hard at trying to make sure that um, the the viewpoint that I take on this is really inclusive. And so it's like talking to that many companies in all sorts of of areas of innovation in healthcare at all different stages of company with all different types of people leading them, all different kinds of investment and backing with different companies behind them. It's like, I'm just proud of the body of th- th- that body of content that I have built over, th- over the years and everything that I hope that it's given to the people who have followed along with me because I, what I love the most is when somebody will say to me like, Oh my God, I, I learned about X company because I saw you interview them and I had no idea. And now we are working with them. Like I love when it like nets out into like an actual relationship or it's like, I've even had some bromances like (laughs) come out of this where it's like, I heard this guy talk. I ran into it at a conference. I mentioned your interview. We got to talking that we're like great friends. We work in similar areas. Like I just love the idea that like I'm leveraging tech to be a cross pollinator and to help people find things that they wouldn't normally find, meet people they wouldn't normally meet. It's like a virtual version of speed dating, I suppose, in the health tech world. 
<laughs> well, we are <laughs> all so people. grateful that you have done that and do that. No, thank you. I Grace. know That's that I'm one person that has benefited from your interviews and learning from you and learning thank from you. the folks that you talk to. So thanks so much for doing that. No, um, thank I'm, you guys for watching. I'd be, I would be lost without you. <laughs> so thank you for your support. <laughs> So on a more, even more personal note, what are things that you do to work your best and make a difference? You know, do you have a regular workout routine, stay healthy, you know, just on a very, very personal level, what are things that you do to keep on top of your game? Oh my God. Okay. So I am, I love Pilates. My best friend actually owns a Pilates studio and, um, I, I do Pilates every single day and I have for years. So I am a big Pilates person. I, I think it's just really challenging. Um, and it's like, honestly, the only time that I'm not thinking about work because you have to really think about the muscles you're engaging and how you're moving your body and you're breathing. And so it's like, that's enough to distract me, which is, yeah, it's a lot harder than it might seem. <laughs> just talking to Pilates me. is so challenging. I have done Pilates it's for years, but only in classes without the machines and everything else. So yeah, I know I'm on the, uh, yeah, I'm on a level. It's mm -hmm. cool. And like she integrates a lot of like kettlebells into her workouts. She's like, she's definitely next Aww. level. She kicks it up a notch. So and she I does a lot of cross training, training too. She does the like a cross training thing. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'm learning how to weight lift too, Grace, like with like an actual like squat rack and I'm getting pretty good. So, so you like, can legit hit like a girl. You I literally can. can <laughs> Or at least squat like one. <laughs> That's great. So it sounds like it really has helped you not only physically, but mentally be able to oh, take God, a break yeah. from the work that you're doing so that you can dive back in with a greater passion and vision. Oh my God, absolutely. And it's like, I think like everybody else to, in this day and age, it's like, it's so nice to do something that doesn't involve a screen. Mm -hmm. Like, it's like, you know, it's like, it's nice to be able to like completely unplug and to like be able to be there and just think about like, physically be present in your body to the point where it's like, you know, you're, you're paying attention to what muscles you're using and your form and how you're breathing and everything like that. I think, I mean, for me, it's like that hour of the day is a very important hour because I mean, I don't know. I talk very fast. I forget to breathe a lot of times. And it's like, I'm focused on other things, like what the other person on the other side of the screen is, is talking about and what they're doing. And I'm so, you know, intently focused on what they're saying and how it's coming out that it's like, I often don't think about myself and my body and what's happening uh, unless it's in that time period. So yeah, I definitely feel like it's, it's the thing that, that unwinds me. It's the thing that energizes me. I love it. Well, that's awesome. We'll all have to try out a Pilates workout from oh, you guys. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> these days. We'll have to do a hit Pilates workout. Hit Pilates. I have advice though. Out. If you're going to do Pilates, it's, re it is really different. It's not yoga. And I think men should try this too, for all the guy listeners that you have out there, Grace, because mm -hmm. it's like definitely aims for that core and a lot of, you know, that, that, that's, that's an important area for everybody. Um, especially your back and your posture. Don't forget your back is part of your core. But if you try Pilates, try it at least two or three times because it is like, you don't get a good workout until you know what you're doing. And it, it definitely takes a couple of tries to figure out how to engage the right things. That is a great recommendation. I'll be sure to, uh, to let everyone know that. So to finish off this wonderful conversation, right, where can our listeners find you on screens and online? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so when you're done with your Pilates and you're like, what have I missed? Exactly. The best, the best place to go. Um, there's two places I'm going to send you guys. So um, I'm going to send you to my YouTube channel, uh, WTF Health's YouTube channel. It is youtube.com slash WTF Health. Um, all of my interviews are there from like the beginning of time. So like, yeah, I mean, they... They go way back. Um, so you can have fun searching through that. If you have any problems or issues, just ping me. Um, and then the other place I would send you to is the healthcareblog.com. Um, that's Matthew Holt's blog. My content runs there. Um, and that, that spot is cool because it's not only my content that runs there, but it's also the show that Matthew and I do together, the Health and 2.0 show we mentioned before about the health tech funding deals. And we have um, hundreds of contributors who write pieces for the blog. Um, and so people like Grace Cordovano, um, gosh, we have so many contributors. And like Grace, we've got like Gia Riccardi, we've got... Um, Oh my God, I'm like blanking. I Mike saw McGee. Grace's oh, great um, oh article gosh, so many in there involved. about health and talking about getting uh, patients on panels. And it was so impactful. Yeah, I mean, it's, really and it covers article. health policy, it covers patient, it covers hit, it covers everything. So it's very wide ranging in terms of the types, uh, types of things I write about. Like Kim Bellard likes to write about technology, but like more of like a socioeconomic look at it. So it's like, there's definitely a lot of great content there as well. So if you guys want to check that out. 
We will definitely be sure to check that out. So before I forget, did you happen to bring tea with you today? I did not bring tea, but I definitely brought the tea, but I didn't bring any tea. (laughs) I'm a coffee drinker. And this is my Chicago mug. So I'm from Chicago. That was where I was born and raised. And I moved away um, a while ago. And when I left, a family friend gave me this mug. So this mug is like 12 years old now. And it's made it through so many moves. Like I've moved around a lot. And in fact, I was nomadic for two and a half years where I did not have an apartment. So this mug was in storage for two and a half years, but it's pulled out now. It lives here in in, um, Jacksonville Beach, Florida. And yeah, this is, I I decided to bring it because it's like, every time I use it, I'm always reminded of home. And I think that Chicago is one of the most kick-ass hometowns you can have. (laughs) Absolutely. And lots of great trade shows too, which I'm sure you get to go back (laughs) fairly regularly. I do. I do. But it's like, I'd rather see like the cut. Yes. Play, then, go to, <laughs> then go to ASCO. <laughs> very true. Very true. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, we really loved having you on, Jess. Grace, thank you so much. This was such a wonderful opportunity. And um, to all your listeners, thank you so much for listening to me today and for following along with Grace. She's a force of nature of her own. <laughs> Thank you, Jess. And uh, I'll send you the check in the mail later for saying okay, that. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks for okay. joining us, folks. Check out the Hit Like a Girl podcast and YouTube page for more amazing guests just like Jess. Cheers. Cheers, Grace. <laughs> thanks for listening. You can learn more about us or this guest by going to our website or visiting us on any of the socials with the handle Hit Like a Girl Pod. Thanks again. See you soon.